God bless you all and welcome to Lighthouse Ranch Church today. As we feast on God's word, as we go to him and, and ask for his tremendous, powerful blessing on our lives, that he might enlighten us today by his truth and that he would give us understanding in his truth and that we, he would teach us his ways that we may be a blessing not only to God, but to the world. That the world may know that there is an eternal God that loves them. Praise the Lord forever. The message today is found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. It's all about the churches, the churches of John's day. The Lord gave him a message for each church and gave John a vision of Christ in the first chapter. As the great high priest, as the exalted Christ, as the exalted Son of Man, Jesus the Christ. And as we look at the church age, we must recognize that the church age is from Pentecost to the rapture. Because the, the book of Revelation is all about the things that will happen after the church age. It's called the things that will be hereafter. And when the church is raptured and uh, taken out of this world, then of course the tribulation time will come, come upon the earth that, was, that will be far worse than anything that has ever happened before and it ever will happen after that. It'll be a horrible time. There will be blessings, there will be people saved, there will be people delivered. Israel will have all of her promises given to her, manifested, finished, and Israel will be saved nationally. Praise God for that. But we're not in the tribulation period yet in our message today. We're still in the age of the church which is sandwiched between Daniel's 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel's vision. The 70th week meaning the time of Jacob's trouble, which is to us the tribulation period. If we look at the church, we notice that this message to each church is specific to each church and that the Lord has a specific message for that church and a special promise for each church. You remember in chapter one that we, the vision was seeing Christ in the midst of the candlesticks, which is the church. And that he is walking amongst them. And that he has the churches right in his hand. And he longs to see the churches be delivered from every bit of worldliness and to walk in his truth. And as we go through each one of these messages today, God being our helper, we'll see that each church not only has a specific message for the way it was in John's day, but that it also applies to us here today. Every church of today has experienced what the churches in Revelation have experienced. Uh, they've gone through the marvelous blessing of, of starting with the Lord and they've gone through persecution and 
gone through the wilderness and they have, many of them have lost their first love. Many of them today are apostate. And this is the message to the churches today. Each and every, in other words, this is God's word and it's eternal. And it is, fits all ages. And what does he say to each church? Look at the title at the head of this chart. It says, hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right, let's look at the first church, Ephesus. I put the word into a chart for the purpose of separating each particular section. The addressing of the church in the first column, how the Lord commended them in the second column, the things that he has against them in the third column, his command and instruction in the fourth column, and his promise in the fifth column. It's fitting for all of these. Starting with the first church, Ephesus. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, what are the golden candlesticks? The church. Tells us in the chapter one that the candlesticks, the golden candlesticks are the churches. I'm gonna take and go down that column so that I don't have to refer to it back and forth as I go through, as God gives me the comments on, uh, what the Lord says to each church. What I'm showing you now is what he, 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 uh, he gives a picture of himself. It, in in uh, Ephesus, it shows that he's the one that's standing in the midst of the churches, the seven candlesticks. In Smyrna now, he says, these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Who is that? None other than Jesus Christ. In Pergamos, he says, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Obviously, Jesus the Christ. Each church gives a different description of Jesus. Thyatira says, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Obviously, Jesus Christ. And Sardis, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. The seven stars, it tells us in the first chapter that they are the, the angels of the churches, meaning the leaders of the church that John is writing the letter to so that the church, church may know of the vision that God gave John to bring unto them the high priest to bless them, to help them to hear the voice of God and to follow him. In Phil uh, to Philadelphia, it says, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. 
no one else but Jesus Christ. And to Laodicea, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, which, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to, to Ephesus. And let's look at this carefully. He commends them saying, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Tremendous works commended, full of works. A truly a blessed church that is doing the work of the Lord. And go to the third column to find out what the Lord is, is finding that they need to correct. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. I put some scripture references here uh, just to emphasize just a little bit how much from the very beginning all the way through the Bible the Lord stresses that we are to love him and the, his whole desire for having a people is to have, have fellowship with him and these people, even though they had a, a clean bill of health and an excellent report card on their works, had forgotten their relationship with the Lord, their, their communion with the Lord, their fellowship with the Lord. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That pretty much covers it. In, De in Deuteronomy 11.1, 1, it says, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. In 11.13 and 14, He says, and it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. If you love me with all of your heart, I will fulfill all your needs abundantly. Glory to God. Isn't that marvelous? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Joshua 23, 11. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. In Psalms 31, 23, Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully, plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Good message in that one. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. 
Now this looks like this church, says because they, they, he, the Lord knows that they, they hated the evil. This church hated the evil. It's, it's just, it, it is dumbfounding to realize that a church could be that close according to the word of God, but lose a heart for God. Get in the pattern of, of working for God without fellowship with God is detrimental. This church was backslidden. With all the wonderful things that they were doing and being commended for. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now, he said after that, this little box down here that I put in this third column. When he said that, he said it after what, what the, the things that he had against them. And so I just put an arrow that it should have gone in the, in the second column for emphasis again. I could have just copied it and pasted it. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So the Nicolaitans are a, a point in the, this study that shows that God wants us to hate him. It says the deeds the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So what are the deeds of the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans, uh, to explain it briefly, could be church government, organized religion is a better way to say it. Organized religion. The, uh, I am going to take you to another chart right now. And it's about the same seven churches. This is Ephesus. And Ephesus meaning, the name meaning permitted or let go, to let go. And the characteristics, as we just saw, they had many righteous works, but lost their first love. They were sternly warned and they were backslidden. Now this was in the apostolic age. That's what this message is about today, to compare these churches and the ages that they were in. The ap what is the apostolic age? Look at the fourth column there. I just put a few things. What does the apostolic age mean to you? What was happening in the apostolic age? True apostles sought God in prayer, ministry of the word, manifested God's presence, evangelized, planted churches. That, look at the heavy activity that the apostolic age people did. Yet the church did the works of the church, but lost their first love. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it dumbfounding? Isn't it astounding? This, this is right after Pentecost. This is from Pentecost to about AD 67. The apostolic age. I put down here Acts 6 4 because it tells something about uh, 
organized religion. You remember, in fact, I'll go to it in the word. Uh, Uh, let's see, reading chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 4. And in those days when the number of disciples were multiplied, remember this is the age of, of the apostles, disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. We know that to be there was trouble in the kitchen. <laughs> I don't know if there's too many cooks in the kitchen or what happened, but there's trouble in the kitchen. So let's look at verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of his disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The 12, who are the 12? Say the apostles. Here the people brought this problem to them that says, it's not reason for us to leave the word of God to go serve tables. Verse 3 says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Notice it didn't say that have a high degree from Princeton or Yale or, or a psychology degree to hang on the wall. It said, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business business. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now this is the word of God. In the apostles age, when the apostles were really reaching the world for Christ, they did it through seeking God and the word of God. Verse 4 says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's the apostolic age. Why did the church in Ephesus leave their first love? We certainly have no excuse, do we? But this happens even today. Now let's go up here to Smyrna. Oh, I didn't finish. Ephesus, now the Lord says in the fourth column, Remember therefore from whence thou art what? Fallen. From whence thou art fallen and repent. The church that has done all these works. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the what? Works. First works. The first works is love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. That church was in serious danger even though as far as workings of the ministry they were perfect. And then his promise to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Mm -hmm. 
God forbid that our church would ever come anywhere near close to losing our first love. There's no work that can outwork the first work of loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. No matter how many works you have, no matter how many um, uh, ministries you have, how many schools you have, how many colleges you have, no matter how many missions you have, no matter how many uh, outreaches you have, As far as God is concerned, it's a failed report card unless you love him more than anything else. Glory to God. Is there a message in that, dear folks? Is there a message in that? Amen. Let's go to Smyrna. Now, Smyrna, the Lord says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Amen. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So they had false brethren there, but they, they weren't deceived. They knew them. And so he, they, he had nothing against that church. But he has some instruction. And it's a prophecy. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. He that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. Now notice the comparison of these two churches. Ephesus had tremendous success in their ministries. No mention of any persecution. No, no mention of any presence of God. Yet they were in that tremendous apostolic age when God was pouring out his spirit all over the place. And here's Smyrna. Here's Smyrna that is just loaded with tribulation and poverty. And the Lord says, you're not poor, you're rich. Amen. And he says, I know you're right in the midst of Satan's seat. I know you're right there in the midst. You know those that are your brothers and there's those that are not. You're gonna have trouble, but don't be afraid. He says, you're going to be thrown into prison, some of you, that you may be tried, you shall have tribulation, Ten days, he says. Be thou faithful even unto death, which shows that some of them will die. And I will give thee a crown of life. Now let's look at that second chart. As we look at Smyrna. Smyrna means myrrh or bitterness. That's some uh, some spices and things that they use in preparation of dead bodies to uh, preserve them. The description says severe persecution. The enemy was revealed. We know that to be Satan. Also false brethren that they're, that's a that's that's actually an enemy in itself but with all of this the church still grew and was strong poor but rich in the lord 
What is the age though? This is a different age here. This is the age of the martyrs. In this same period, Stephen was stoned. James, the, the brother of John, was beheaded. And, and these two uh, martyrs were 10 years apart. Philip was crucified. Remember Philip that evangelized up there in Samaria? Matthew, he was beat to death with a halberd, which is a battle axe with a big spike. They beat him to death with that. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was the head of the Jerusalem church, he was clubbed to death. His brains were knocked out with a club. Matthias was beheaded. Andrew was crucified. Mark, that wrote this, the second gospel, was drugged to death. They drug him till he died. Not a very nice message. Peter was crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified the way his Lord was. Paul was beheaded. Jude was crucified. Bartholomew crucified. Thomas, remember Thomas? They killed him with a spear. Luke, they hung Luke. Simon Zelotes, they crucified him. And the apostle John, that was writing this, that were reading his writings, they put him in boiling oil. But God miraculously delivered him. And so they put him on the Isle of Patmos, where the Lord dealt with him with this vision and where he wrote this book of Revelation. Barnabas was martyred. It doesn't say how, but he was martyred. And many saints martyred, were martyred for refusing to worship the emperor because this is the time, the martyrs' age is when the emperors were putting forth that they were gods and, and, and depicting themselves as God, as, as a forerunner or pointing to the time of revelation when the Antichrist will do that very thing. And if you didn't worship them, they would slaughter you, martyr you. I just read these names to you, but at the same time when they kill these people, untold thousands of Christians were murdered right along with them. Now, I want to take you to this last call you. This, this shows the emperors in that time. There's 10 emperors. Remember it said you're gonna have tribulation 10 days? Well, there's 10 emperors and each one is a, is a specific wave of persecution that's more severe than the one before it. And it starts out with Nero, who burnt down Jerusalem. Remember that in AD 67. Many Christians were killed in that, burned in the fire. There were even Christian cities that were completely destroyed because Nero was so full of the, of the devil and it just went crazy and started burning everything. 
because they wouldn't worship him. Domitian in AD 81 did the same thing. Trajan, AD 108. Demon possessed. Marcus Aurelius, AD 162. Severus, AD 192. Maximus, AD 235. Decius, AD 249. Valerian, AD 257. Aurelian, AD 274. And the last one, Diocletian, lasted 10 years. Remember the prophecy. You shall have tribulation 10 days. Here's a fulfillment of that prophecy. 10 years from AD 303 to 313. Churches today, there's people that go into church all over the world and the enemy is out like a roaring lion against churches that are um, full of the Holy Ghost and fire. One of the severest places of, of uh, persecution that I know of that I've witnessed personally was Nigeria. And it's the Muslim faith that was burning churches down there. We haven't been there for, oh, I guess 30 or 40 years since we were there. But today, the Muslims in Nigeria, the Boko Haram is slaughtering Christians right and left in this day and in this hour. One of the most dangerous spots in the world is Nigeria today. And that's just one country. It's happening all over the world. It wasn't too long ago that we witnessed people being beheaded in our land. Yes. There are a few cases. And today, do you remember? We've had shooters that come into churches and start shooting. Mm -hmm. It's because of the enemy. It's because of, because of Satan. Because he knows his time is short. He's a liar. He's a thief. I was reminded as we prayed for Israel today, after I got through, I'm praying all this prayer to the Lord. What we need to be praying is, Lord, fill us with your Holy Ghost. Fill us with the power of your word that we may preach it without fear or favor that you will stretch forth your hand to heal in the marvelous name of Jesus the Christ. That's the only thing that's going to change, people. This church that was doing the greatest was martyred. And the, the testimony, as I read these church fathers testifying of this, this time of the martyrs. Time after time, person after person, it was noted that those that were looking on, even those that were accusing them, in many cases, fell on their knees and repented when they saw the, the attitude of those that were being martyred. No resistance, fully submissive, still marvelously ministering the word of God right to their death. 
you're not poor. And the Lord says, you're rich. Amen. He said, you will eat of the tree of life and you'll not be bothered by the second death, which is the tribulation period. Now we go to Pergamos. The Lord says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even those days, in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Fourth column says, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a, a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. These people had false preachers, false messages there. The 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 leader of the church, though, is allowing these false teachers. Let's look at the other chart. Pergamos. Spiritual fornication. Deceptive preaching. World seduction. Immorality. Tolerated. Remember that Balaam was enticed by Balak to 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 preach a deceptive message to the children of Israel, and when the Israel was enticed to go be a part of one of their feasts, they saw these beautiful women, and so they started committing sin there. And Balak did it for money, and Balaam rather did it for money and for esteem to be recognized for his own gain. That's what the Lord gave as a description for this church in Pergamos. Now the age here, this is the age of the church and state in the progress, uh, uh, progression of the church. Now we're about the year 213, uh, 313 up to AD 800. In this time, Constantine came on the scene and set forth the marriage of the church and the state until about 590 when he was helpful there to, to put, uh, install the first pope. And they didn't view the millennium at all. They, view, they viewed the past the millennium, after the millennium. In other words, the church now will carry on. Christ has done all he's going to do. He's already come back, so now they're carrying on 
for the Lord. How deceiving. They were deceived and they were deceiving everybody else. That's the church of Pergamos. Now let's look at the church in Thyatira. The Lord says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. There again, they're not as up on their faithfulness to the Lord as they are with the Lord's works. Look at the long list here in the third column. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Remember Jezebel? That woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. Notice this now. This is really important. She calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. This is what's going on in that church. And to eat things sacrificed unto idols. In other words, forbidden practices are allowed. And the Lord says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. This is liking to the to the Jezebel in the Old Testament. But the Lord gives this person the opportunity to repent. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. What does that mean? They're going through the great tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds. Look at the mercy of God to even give them that opportunity. Except they repent of their deeds and I will kill her children with death. That means every one of them that, that follow them and all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your what? Your works. But I want you to notice now his uh, exhortation in the fourth column. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already. Hold fast till I come, and he that he overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. The blessing is he that, that says, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. Let's look at the description of the time now that this is representative of in the church age. Mm. 
Saratera means a continual sacrifice. The description is false prophet is tolerated in that church. Doctrinal, doctrinal corruption, spiritual fornication, lacks on forbidden practices. You notice though that the Lord says in there that there's a mixed congregation. There's some that love the Lord there and some that do not. Some that are following the Lord and some that are not, I should say. Now let's look at the age. This is the age of the Roman Catholic Church. It's called the Papacy Age or the Papal Domination where the Catholic Church is dominating. Authority over the word of God, can you imagine? Who has authority over the word of God? Only the Lord. The scriptures were withheld from the laity. The common person in the church was not allowed the word of God to have it in his possession. Pagan theosophy, ritualism, secret knowledge, religion. That's where your, your, your lodges and things come from, as well as, as those uh, different sections of, of the church that uh, are secretive. That's that's in the age of eight, AD 800 to AD 1517. So we see that each church is representative of a different age. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> All right, let me hurry. Now we go to Sardis. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. How many? A few. But it's talking to the church now. He says you have a few there that are going to walk with me in white. What does that mean? They're righteous. And they'll be in heaven with him. They'll go in the rapture. Praise the Lord. So he says to the church as a whole, I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. What? They have a name. They look like they're alive, but they're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found the works, thy works perfect before God. Notice this now. The Lord is speaking to the church. He says, some of your people are going to make it. But you'd better shape up because you're dead. And if you don't repent, Everything else is ready to die. Look at the promise, or the, rather the exhortation. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Now that's important, that wording is important. Remember therefore how you hast received and heard and hold fast. What is it speaking of? The word of God. Remember what you heard? and you received it, mm -hmm. you better hold fast to it and repent. Isn't that what it's saying? Yes. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know the hour I will come upon thee. And then of course, the heart of the Lord, he's always got a tremendous promise. 
He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If we couldn't get our name blotted out of the book of life, why is it in there? Amen. Amen. All right, let's look at the age that it represents. Sardis. Sardis means like those escaping. Remember, I had a few names that were walking in truth. The description, it's a dead church with a few faithful believers. It's formalistic, ritualistic, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, 2 Timothy 3, 5. What age is that in? The Reformation. Say hallelujah. Aided the circulation of scripture. Praise God for that fact. That the scripture was being allowed to be in the hands of the laity. Justification by faith was revived. True worship of God was revived. It was tremendous, but they held to the amillennial view, which is no millennium. And it was also the rise of the state church, like the Church of England, etc. That age was from AD 1520 to AD 1750, that that church represents. when the word was being spread. Praise God. Now, we go to the next one, which is Philadelphia. It says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Amen. So this is the church that the Lord has blessed because they're holding to the word of God. And the Lord promises to bring those that are not following the word of God to Philadelphia's ministry, that they may know that there is a living God. There's nothing against them. On the fourth column, the exhortation is, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which is the tribulation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Once saved, always saved, doesn't say that. The exhortation is hang on, hang on, so that no man robs you of your crown. Now the blessing, he that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. What a blessing, amen? What a blessing. Let's look at Philadelphia age. What is the age that they represent? The missionary age. From AD 1750 to AD 1948. 
a couple hundred years there. Philadelphia, that means brotherly love. Description of that church is they kept God's word. Kept God's word. Thou hast kept my word. Therefore, I will not uh, allow you to go into tribulation. The true church in all ages, from Pentecost to the rapture, That's descriptive of some churches today. The missionary uh, age was revived pre-tribulation view. The spread of the word of God to the world. A few names here, William Carey, the Wesleys, Finney, Edwards, Moody, the Pentecostals. The age of revival. Now we go to the last one, the Church of Laodicea. Doesn't have anything there to commend them on. What he has against them is. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. His exhortation is, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What is that? That's God's word. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment. What is that? The righteousness of Christ. That thou mayest be clothed and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I get, grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father, his throat. You know, isn't it kind of amazing? This is a church of God. Where is Jesus? He's outside trying to get in. He's knocking at the door into a church that's lukewarm. Do you know anything that's more distasteful than something that's halfway and it isn't all the way, it rides a fence, it's in the middle, it's neither here nor there, it's phony, it's hypocritical. Let's look at the age. Okay, the age is the apostasy age. The Laodicean means people ruling. People ruling the church, not God. 64 AD, Pastor? Pardon me? 64 AD? 64 AD, I don't understand. The apostle age. The Apostle Age is A.D. 1948 to the rapture. This is the age. We're in the age of apostasy. The description is to God that's thoroughly distasteful. Remember he said, oh, 
spew it out of my mouth. Lukewarm, rich church that is spiritually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The Lord counsels them to get back to him, his word and his righteousness. Remember that? Yeah. Or will be expelled from him. Spew thee out of my mouth. So describe the age of apostasy. It began in the late 1800s and is characterized by the start of Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, New Age Theosophy movement under Alice Bailey, Seven Day Adventists under Ellen G. White, Christian Science under Mary Baker Eddy, and nonetheless, the United Nations started the World Council of Churches, which is the pits. I am reminded of what the Lord reminded me of in my prayer for Jerusalem in the United States. We need to pray for the Holy Ghost anointing in such a magnitude that it will have an impact. It's the only thing that's going to change people. It isn't a cleaned up government. We found that out in the church of Ephesus. They had an excellent government. They had tremendous works. Everything was in place. Everything neat as a pin. But they didn't have the anointing of God. We need the anointing of God, folks. We have the anointing of God. God is in this church. God is doing marvelous things. He's doing wonderful things. But I want to see us reaching with the message. Any of you that are listening today that are not here with us, you're on the internet, or anyone as we pray here that might get a hold of this message and read it or listen to it because they're on the website. You can hear this message, you can play it, you can read it. It's information that you should know. The message to the churches is from God to every church of every age. God help us to have the clean report of a godly church that is on fire for him, that is led by him that is immersed in him, that is sold out to him, that is completely surrendered and submissive to him. Oh God, is there anything else? We that pray for our, our needs to be met, isn't this the greatest need we have, oh God? You are the supplier of our needs, and I plead with you, have mercy on us, O oh God, in this age of apostasy. Bring upon us your powerful spirit in the magnitude that it will be used of God, that you will be glorified and your word goes forth to cast out the demons and to heal the sick and to set the captives free. Thank you, Father for your tremendous grace and your marvelous instruction in the word of God and the understanding of what you want and your will and your ways. Use us for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. God bless you, everyone. God bless you abundantly. Put Jesus number one in your life and let him bless you above all things. God bless you.